The DD archetype, as well as its sub-archetype DDD, is one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most well-known combo archetypes, infamous for its legendary flowchart of insane two-card combos you have to memorize to properly pilot it. But that's not what we're here to talk about today, as DD is also one of the archetypes loaded with the most historical and mythological references of any Yu-Gi-Oh deck. As well as very unique lore involving all of these legendary figures seemingly working for a company when you look at their original OCG names. Today, we'll be doing a deep dive in explaining the references, both the names and the artwork of the DD archetype in this episode of the Unknown Side of Yu-Gi-Oh. DD has a huge number of main deck monsters, more than most archetypes, and while basically all of them are some reference to some kind of mythological beast, we'll be skipping over some of those. You probably don't need me to explain to you where they got the idea for DD Cerberus or DD Griffin, or why the artwork depicts a dog with three heads or a lion eagle hybrid creature. The more interesting part of the main deck DD monsters are the DD Savant monsters. This is a series of monsters who are named after and inspired by famous scientific minds in history. Kicking off this group is DD Savant Copernicus, named for Nicholas Copernicus. He was a Renaissance era thinker and astronomer, then commonly known as a polymath, who was most famous for his development of the model of heliocentrism. Through meticulous study of celestial patterns, Copernicus determined that the Earth and all planets in the sky were revolving around the Sun as opposed to the common belief that everything else in the universe revolved around the Earth. This was one of science and history's greatest breakthroughs, beginning the early steps of the scientific revolution. In this card's artwork, you can even see it playing homage to this, as it depicts an artistically stylized heliocentric model with a blazing sun in the middle of a model with rings depicting planetary orbits surrounding it. Continuing the astronomer theme, we next have DD Savant Kepler. This references Johannes Kepler, a mathematician and astronomer, who even did important work as an inventor in the creation of the refracting telescope, sometimes known as the Keplerian telescope. Kepler is credited with doing much of the work to bring the field of astronomy out of the more vague ties it had to the less than scientific astrology, and bringing it closer to math and physics as a true natural science, rather than a tool used strictly for religious and ceremonial thinking. Kepler is perhaps best known for the creation of Kepler's first and second laws, theorizing that planets move in elliptical patterns around the sun, and that the speed of these paths were proportional to how close the planets were to the sun. These laws inform the artistic reference in Dede Savant Kepler's artwork showing a heliocentric model much like DD Savant Copernicus, but emphasizing the different elliptical orbits and how much these orbits vary in size based on how far away from the sun in the center of the monster. Still following in those astronomical footsteps, our next savant is DD Savant Galilei, named for Galileo Galilei. Galileo is a similarly famous astronomer known for both his championing of the then controversial heliocentric model of the solar system, but also for his discoveries and calculations about the orbits of the planets and the existence of smaller moons that orbited other planets. While he was the inventor of other scientific tools, Galileo is most associated with the telescope due to his most significant discoveries coming from the usage of the tool. Galileo proved Johann Kepler's laws, cementing the heliocentric model that Copernicus theorized many years prior. You can see those telescope discoveries paid homage to the artwork in DD Savant Galilei, depicting a massive telescope lens situated in a rock, like how telescopes using observatories would frequently be built into mountains to get a clearer view of the sky. And for the last of our astronomical savants, we have DD Savant Newton. This card references Isaac Newton, and to call him an astronomer like the rest would be greatly underselling Newton's contribution to science and the overall impact he's had. Similar to Kepler, Newton is most known for establishing his laws, known as Newton's Laws of Motion. The most important one for this topic is Newton's third law, based around the conservation of momentum. This is often demonstrated by Newton's cradle device, which is a series of balls hanging from the same structure. When you lift one ball from one end and drop it, it hits the other balls, which transfers the momentum to the ball on the opposite end, which then moves, thus demonstrating the conservation of momentum, even through multiple distinct objects. This device is referenced in DD Savant Newton's artwork with Newton's cradle built into its left side. Also, much like DD Savant Galilei, Newton's artwork shows a type of telescope built into its bottom half, though this time depicting Newton's reflector, the first successful use and creation of a reflector telescope created by Newton to further his astronomical study. Next up, move away from the astronomers of the 15-1600s and into the engineers of the 1800s with DD Savant Nikola, named for the one and only Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla is best known for his pioneering work as an electrical and mechanical engineer, primarily his development and champion of the use of the alternating current, or AC electrical current which forms the vast majority of electricity transferred in the modern day. DD Savant Nikola's art shows a large red ball, presumably a plasma ball, at the monster's center, as well as little electrical arcs streaming off of it in the background to be reminiscent of the famous Tesla coil, a device invented by Tesla that was used to show specific kinds of alternating current. 
Opposite Nicola, we have our next monster, DD Savant Thomas. This time, the reference is obvious Nikola Tesla's similarly famous counterpart, rival, and employer, Thomas Edison. He's primarily known for his support of direct current electricity, also known as DC current, as well as his innovations and in patenting of the common incandescent light bulb. The art in DD Savant Thomas unsurprisingly shows a giant glass container with a mural style depiction of a sun inside mounted to the monster. A light source in the sun inside a glass container is a rather metaphorical but obvious allusion to light bulbs. Also, much like in his Nicola's artwork, Thomas also depicts background electricities jolting everywhere in reference to Edison's work with the DC electrical current. And a final fun fact about these two involves their levels in pendulum scales. While the previous astronomical DD savants have extreme 1 and 10 scales that make them play well with each other and most of the monsters, Nicola and Tesla very explicitly have conflicting stats when they show up together. Nicola is level 6 with a pendulum scale of 8, and Thomas is a level 8 with a pendulum scale of 6. These stats ensure that you will never be able to pendulum summon either of these monsters if their rival is in the pendulum zone. For instance, if Nicola is in one of your scales with its 8 pendulum scale, you can't pendulum summon Thomas who's level 8 and vice versa. While this kind of inherent anti-synergy isn't ideal in a deck, it's there to show how Tesla and Edison were rivals and oftentimes enemies despite working together. This is especially true in their rivaling ideas on electricity supply in the famous War of the Currents, with Tesla supporting AC power and Edison supporting DC power. Just one more small piece of historical references hidden in these cards. And that's it for the release savant so far, but I would be remiss not to point out one last reference. There are some DD savants that appear in the anime that haven't seen print yet, and the most interesting of these is the anime-only card, DD Savant Schrodinger. While this is an obvious reference to Aaron Schrodinger, one of history's greatest physicists who led several breakthroughs in quantum theory, I wanted to mention him specifically because Schrodinger actually has another reference in the DD archetype, DD Ghost. This card depicts an obscured cat locked inside a crystalline container, and it doesn't take a quantum physicist to figure out that the cat in the box that's being called Ghost is a reference to the incredibly famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment where Schrodinger used the uncertainty of whether a cat is alive or dead in a box if a flask of poison with 50% chance of breaking is in there with it, and that you won't know until you observe it, which breaks the uncertainty. And, well, in DD Ghost's name, it clearly implies that someone locked in and it didn't turn out well for the cat, or could always see the cat since the box happens to be translucent. Don't worry though, it was just a thought experiment and no cats were harmed in the making of this video or the quantum physics experiment. And that's it for the DD savants, but let's move on to the grander figures in the DDD subarchetype, which depict larger than life mythological and historical figures from the ancient past or from literature. We'll kick it off with the mythological figures, with our first one being DDD Curse King Siegfried. This synchro is a reference to the German mythological hero Siegfried, who is derived from the Norse myths of Sigurd. Siegfried is best known as the famous example of the hero who rescues his beloved Bernhilde from a dragon. Unfortunately, there is no DDD version of Brunhilde, but at least there's a Valkyrie one. The other two mythic touchstones of the character is that he reforges his father's shattered blade and happens upon a dangerous ring that curses him with misfortune. A couple of storytelling pieces that you might recognize from Lord of the Rings. DDD Curse King Siegfried alludes to both of these, with his massive sword in the artwork as well as the curse part of his name for suffering the curse of the magic ring. On to another dramatic legend, our next up to bat is DDD Dragonbane King Beowulf. Beowulf is an Old English and dramatic mythological hero who, much like Siegfried, was known for daring feats, and most importantly, slain dragons. They really dug into the name for the artistic inspiration on this one, depicting him as a literal wolfman. This art would make him a better reference to the monster Grendel from the story rather than Beowulf himself. Beowulf's 3000 attack value makes it quite adept at crashing into the many Yu-Gi-Oh dragons that like to stick to the 3000 attack stat line. And the fact that this would destroy both pays homage to Beowulf succumbing to his wounds and dying after defeating the dragon of her names. Keeping with the old English mythological references, next up is DDD Dragon King Pendragon. One of the few main deck DDD monsters, Dragon King Pendragon is a reference to King Arthur, also known as Arthur Pendragon a character most well known for being the King of Britain in the Knights of the Round Table mythology. Similar to DDD Dragonbane King Beowulf, they went all in in using the name literally for the artwork, taking Arthur Pendragon and making him look like a straight up dragon rather than a noble king. If you want a more knightly flair and a bigger dive into the Knights of the Round Table references, you could check out the Noble Knights archetype who go all out in the knight theme. Next up is DDD Marksman King Tell. This Xyz monster is based on William Tell, a Swiss folk hero who may have served inspiration or been conflated for the better known Robin Hood. Both are known for incredible marksmanship, cunning plans, and expertise in the wilderness. 
Marksman King Tell actually does a more direct art reference, as the monster is clearly holding some kind of forearm mounted cannon or crossbow to allude to William Tell's mastery of the crossbow. It even has an effect very common on ranged weapon themed monsters like Cannon Soldier or Cannibal Turtle by having a 1000 light point burn effect living up to the marksman title in both name and in William Tell's lore. Another famous legend of William Tell is the cliché of him shooting an apple off of a friend's head. And in Marksman King Tell's artwork, his torso looks suspiciously like a bright red apple with a chunk missing off the top of it. For our final mythological character, we have DDD Abyss King Gilgamesh. As the name implies, the monster is a reference to the Mesopotamian warrior King Gilgamesh, titular hero of the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is the first monster so far that also has a slight variation in its OCG name where the monster's title also includes a position at a company. In Gilgamesh's case, its title is CNO, or Chief Networking Officer, which fits with a Link monster in a Pendulum archetype, helping coordinate Pendulum summons of other officers to its Link zones. That aside, the more obvious reference besides Gilgamesh's name is its artwork. It depicts Gilgamesh equipped with an unreasonable amount of weapons being wielded or strapped to its back. This is a direct nod to other, modern references to Gilgamesh in Final Fantasy RPG games and in the Fate series of games, mangas, and anime. These love to depict Gilgamesh as a warrior overloaded with weapons, and in Final Fantasy's case, often as an antagonist who's trying to snatch legendary weapons away from others. And while I don't know a lot about the Fate series, they clearly drew some inspiration from the Final Fantasy version of Gilgamesh and the summoning of an absurd number of weapons with the Gate of Babylon ability. Though there's more than one Gilgamesh in that universe, so they might even be referencing more than that. And that's it for our purely mythological beings. There's still plenty of deities left to cover. Let's start with the legendary deities who were inspired by for sure real life people, kicking off with DDD Oracle King Da Ark. This fusion monster is meant to reference Joan of Arc, one of history's most famous female figures for her zealous rallying in defense of France during the Hundred Years' War. Obviously, the Ark in the name is the direct reference, but even being called an oracle alludes to Joan of Arc's prophetic vision she claimed came directly from God. The artwork helps confirm this, as despite having King in the name like many DDD extract monsters, Oracle King Da Ark is presented as feminine in contrast to most DDD monsters being explicitly masculine. And despite being a fiend and having some fiendish visuals, her artwork depicts an almost angelic figure with its gold and white armor and enormous wings helping sell the divine aspect of Joan of Arc's story as both a soldier and a prophetess of God. Though they are demonic-style batwings, so it's a fiendish angel to stay in line with DDD's being evil fiendish takes on these legendary figures. From one king to another, next we have DDD Rebel King Leonidas. Another of the main deck DDD monsters, Rebel King Leonidas is for sure a reference to the legendary Spartan King Leonidas. If the name wasn't enough, the artwork is a dead giveaway as the monster is sporting a Corinthian helmet, a large round shield, and the flowing red cape often associated with Leonidas. Even its effects play into Leonidas' most legendary moment. Its monster effect lets you special summon it from your hand when you take life point damage, gain life points equal to the damage, and then prevents you from taking effect damage while it's on the field. And its pendulum scale effect is similar, letting you sacrifice Leonidas to prevent effect damage and heal yourself for the same amount. While these effects are just nifty in DD decks to offset the dark contracts, Leonidas is best known for its self-sacrifice to slow the Persian Empire down and prevent it from overcoming Greece, and his card is quite good at leaping into the line of fire to protect you. And speaking of the Persian Empire, next up we have DDD Stone King Darius. Named for Darius the Great, one of antiquity's most revered rulers over Persia during the reign of the Archimedid Empire. While most of the references in the DDD archetype come from folk heroes or legendary generals, Darius the Great was best known for his administrative and bureaucratic accomplishments, as well as his benevolence as a ruler in ancient times. This is reflected in his ability with DDD Stone King Darius's ability to recycle your dark contracts to draw a card, turning your useless paperwork into something of real value. Even his title Stone King is a potential allusion to the incredible amount of great construction projects he ordered and funded from Egypt to Babylon and makes its DDD's only Earth monster for that unique status. This also helps round out the elemental attribute cycle for the DDD kings. We move from the ruler of Persia to the conqueror of Persia next, with both DDD Gus King Alexander and DDD Gusk High King Alexander. These two Alexanders are in reference to the Macedonia king and general Alexander the Great, best known for conquering much of the Western world, stretching from Greece and Egypt all the way to modern-day Pakistan, engulfing Persia before his untimely death. Though there isn't much to glean outside of his name, as his artwork looks more like a reference to the Clearwing monsters than Alexander the Great, you'd think they'd at least squeeze in a reference to the Gordian Knot. These Gus Kings do represent the win attribute in the DDD's King Cycle, and DDD Gus High King Alexander is another of the DDD monsters to have a corporate title in its original name, in this case being an executive at a company. 
Next up is another double feature with DDD Flame King Genghis and DDD Flame High King Genghis. Both cards directly reference the ruler and founder of the first Mongolian Empire, Genghis Khan. That said, the references sort of dry up there, just like with Alexander. While the Mongols were known for many things, such as their incredibly wide-spanned empire, mastery over warfare, cavalry, archery, and so on and so on, the effects of the cards, while powerful, don't play into the legendary nature of the Mongols or Genghis Khan. The effect of special summon another DD monster from the graveyard when another DD monster is summoned does help you swarm the field, which could be associated with the Mongols' horde natures of overwhelming numbers. But it's still only one extra conditional special summon rather than a real swarm of monsters. And the art showing a demon wielding a giant sword and shield definitely doesn't line up with what the Mongolians were best known for. Just like with Alexander, the Flame King Genghis duo continue the elemental representation by being the fire attribute amongst the DDD kings. And DDD Flame High King Genghis also has the executive tile in its OCG name. And for the last of our historical figure DDDs, we have the ones who supplanted the titles of King and Emperor, with DDD Wave King Caesar and DDD Wave High King Caesar. These cards reference Julius Caesar, member of the First Triumvirate and dictator of ancient Rome. A man so synonymous with conquest and rule, Roman rulers would often call themselves Caesar rather than king, emperor, or dictator, as it was seen as a greater name to take. Caesar is best known for being one of history's greatest tacticians, as well as his proclivity for recruiting his enemy soldiers during the Roman Civil War. This lines up well with Wave King Caesar's effect as special summon monsters from your graveyard that were destroyed in the same turn at the end of the battle phase. Caesar often gaining more troops than he lost at the end of a battle. Though, Wave High King Caesar's generic, if powerful, negation effect doesn't really play into that lore. Also, much like the previous two kings, DDD Wave King High Caesar is an executive of the DDs in its OCG card name. One final small fact before we move on is you can also tentatively categorize DDD Supreme King Kaiser under Caesar's reference as well, as Kaiser is just the German version of the term Caesar in reference to a ruler, with the artwork to match it as it carries the armored skirt and red cloak often associated with Roman soldiers in art and historical depictions. Though, I don't think Romans were known for the use of upside down swords, or whatever it is Supreme King Kaiser is holding there. And in our next DDD section, we have the DDD monsters that represent finality, conclusions, and the end of the world. We will start with the DDD whose name even alludes to the beginning with DDD duo Don King Kali Yuga. This card is in reference to the Yuga cycle in Hinduism, a four-part cycle where each part represents an age or extended period of time in the world. There are four Yugas, and Kali Yuga is the fourth, final and worst of the Yugas. It represents conflict and the evils of the present spilling forth across the world and is dominated by evil, godlike beings known as Kali. This cycle is also meant to eventually lead back into the first of the cycle, the Krita Yuga, when the Golden Age of Humanity is come to pass again after the Kali Yuga is done. Kali Yuga bringing forth the dawn, despite representing the final piece of the cycle of the universe, is very in line with this absurdly powerful effect to completely negate everything on the field for the rest of the turn when it's summoned as well as its mass backward removal effect wiping the world clean for what comes next. It's even sitting on a majestic throne in the artwork, quite apt for the king that represents both the beginning and the end. Even its OCG corporate name leads into this association with leading into something new, as Kali Yuga has the founder title. Which makes sense, as when Kali Yuga is done, you would have your new world, or company, in this analogy. Sticking with the end and rebirth of the world theme, up next we have GDD Oblivion King Abyss Ragnarok. This references the Norse end of the world event Ragnarok, where all the gods will die, the world will freeze over, and eventually give way to a new world. Oblivion King Abyss Ragnarok continues the trend of Kali Yuga, also sitting on an ostentatious throne. Ragnarok doesn't really have that much else as far as references go, though it does seemingly combine with the Caesar line of DDD cards and the Fusion Evolution DDD Wave Oblivion King Caesar Ragnarok. While the fusion materials can use any two DDD monsters, its name is clearly a mashup of Ragnarok and Caesar, into a hulky monstrosity of a boss monster. And just like Caesar and Kali Yuga, both the regular and fusion version of Ragnarok also have a corporate job title hidden in its original name. In this case, Ragnarok is apparently the chairman of a company, and hey, he is sitting in a chair. Next up, we have a series of cards that all revolve around one particular monster, DDD Doom King Armageddon. In the anime, this is Declan Agaba's signature monster around which the DDD deck seemingly centralizes on. Which makes sense, as in its OCG name, it's stated to be the CEO, or Chief Executive Officer, in the company set up of the DDDs. This is typically the highest position in a company. This wouldn't make much sense for one of the less powerful monsters mechanically, but does make sense as Declan's ace. From there on, we have a few variants, retrains, or evolutions of Armageddon. For instance, DDD Vice King Requiem, who is very reminiscent in its artwork of Doom King Armageddon, 
but its name rank is COO, or Chief Operating Officer, and that's usually the second in command at a company just below the CEO, so it's treated as support for Armageddon. And that tracks given the type of finality in his name. Requiems are usually songs meant to be played after the deaths of other people, a song of repose for seen souls off to the afterlife. If you were going to have a world-ending event like Ragnarok, Armageddon, or Kali Yuga happen, then a Requiem would naturally be paired with that. Our next world-ending theme monster in the company is DDD Chaos King Apocalypse. Its corporate position is Director General, which can be the same thing as CEO, but is often another high-ranking supportive executive who supports the CEO, once again revolving around the central Doom King Armageddon. Not much else to say about it besides that, since its art just looks like a beefed-up DDD Doom King Armageddon. None of these three are especially powerful enough to justify these really ominous world-ending names associated with them. They are generally just regular combo enablers, extenders, and utility pieces in the archetype, so there's not much to dig into lore-wise with them. The entire cataclysmic naming convention of the DDDs just seems to spawn from DDD Doom King Armageddon's own name being so edgy. Sticking to the topic of Armageddon, its status as the ace monster of Declan also earns it some more powerful extra deck evolutions, and these actually deal with Yu-Gi-Oh lore as opposed to real-life lore mythology. The fusion version is known as DDD Super Doom King Purple Armageddon. The purple in its name is just an obvious reference to the purple card borders of fusion monsters, but the more interesting thing is the artwork. Purple Armageddon's artwork seems to be a mashup of DDD Doom King Armageddon and the final antagonists of the dual monsters and GX eras of Yu-Gi-Oh, Zork Necrophades, and Night Shroud. This is evidenced by the large draconic head growing out of its lower extremities and how the torso design has been changed to resemble Zork's downward curved horns. It also carries the two small wings on its back that resemble Night Shroud's wing-like dual disc. Declan is clearly calling back to the two villains of the earliest era of Yu-Gi-Oh, back when only fusion monsters were available as extra deck mechanics, and homaging the most dangerous villains of the fusion era. Following that theme, up next is DDD Super Doom King Bright Armageddon. This is the Synchro Evolution, and the Bright in its name is both a reference to the bright white card border of Synchro Monsters, as well as potentially referencing Yusei Fudo's star-themed boss monsters like Stardust Dragon and its entire Synchro Evolution line. The monster's art references Zone, the final antagonist of the 5D's era of Yu-Gi-Oh! and user of the infamous Time Lords. Bright Armageddon's face and arms represent Zone's mask and the huge floating arms he used to manipulate things. It even has a large, fairly simple, and geometric torso that's reminiscent of the Time Lord's geometric shaped chest used to depict faces. And for our final Armageddon evolution, we have DDD Super Doom King Dark Armageddon. With this name, the Dark references the black card borders of Xyz monsters and is homage to the Xyz focus Zexal Arrow's primary antagonist, Don Thousand. The monster has a ton of wiggling tentacles coming out of the gate with it, which is a direct reference to Don Thousand, who often used tentacles to attack or trap people. The monster has also come in of a large gate, which makes sense when you consider the monster's entire form seems to be a direct visual reference to the Baron Emblem, a symbol of the Baron Dimension where Don Thousands was banished to and rules over as a malevolent overlord. The entire Armageddon line of the DDD cards helps show Declan's premise in the Arc 5 anime as someone with questionable methods willing to use whatever power suits him to succeed. A very odd trait for one of the protagonists of the story, but he's the bad boy rival to yu -Oh's brighter primary antagonist nature. So, these overly dark and monstrous creatures serve to make Declan a good foil as a combination rival and ally of Yu-Gi-Oh's. His ability to draw on the power of the worst villains of Yu-Gi-Oh's past eras and master each summoning mechanic is a big part of what people love about him as a rival. There's still one last DDD to cover though, and a fitting one for the final entry. Our last monster is DDD Divisor King Des X Machinix. Unlike the previous entries who were all named for or associated with cataclysms that end the world, Machinex completely subverts this by referencing the greatest power of all storytelling, the power of the author. Deus Ex Machinex's name is a direct allusion to the Deus Ex Machina, the literary term that literally means God from the machine. It's a well-known writing mechanic and the name is meant to evoke the omnipotent power of God, but used by the author as a machine to resolve an unresolvable situation or plot point in a story so as to get the desired ending, often with an abrupt or unforeseen occurrence, that warps everything up as if God just stepped in and made it happen. While Ragnaroks and Armageddons are foreboding stories about things ending, Deus Ex Machina is the true ultimate power when it comes to bringing a story to its end. The Divisor King, sitting on his throne like the other top executives of the DDD, also carries the title of President of the Company, the only title that can stand equal to that of Armageddon's CEO title. DDD Divisor King Deus Ex Machinex is arguably DDD's strongest boss monster, and carries a name and title that gives it the highest rank and the most power possible in the story, the strongest finality for our final monster. And that's it for the DD archetype. 
Are there any bits of trivia or DD lore that we may have missed that you know about? Or are there any topics you'd like to see us cover like this? If so, leave those down suggestions in the comments down below.